Welcome to Be Her Talk, a political podcast that adds a sprinkle of trap music, Beyonce, and Asada Secure to unflavored news. Each Sunday, we discuss race, politics, and culture from a Black millennial perspective. And for the next several weeks, we are happy to announce that we partner with Black Enterprise as our official media sponsor as we unpack the 2020 election and its impact on the Black community. My name is Selena Hill, and I'm the digital editor at Black Enterprise and also the founder of Be Her Talk. I am super happy to be here with you guys. And today we're talking about voter suppression and what needs to be done to make sure that our community is protected at the polls this November. Later on, I will introduce to you Latasha Brown. She's the co-founder of Black Voters Matter to the show. But for now, let me kick it back to my co-host, Stanley Fritz, to introduce himself and to get this show started. Selena Hill with the baby hoop earrings. What's going on? <laughs> This is Stanley Fritz. You can find me on Twitter at Stan Fritz. You can find me on Instagram at Stan Fritz. Actually, my Twitter is suspended until Monday at 12 p.m. So you can really? Find me Again? Twitter. All right, let's not talk about that. <laughs> um, you could find me on my burner account, Dark Skin Swindle. That's why I brought it back, Dark Skin Swindle on Twitter. And if you're extra bored, go to Snapchat. You can find me as Dark Skin Swindle there, too. But I don't post a damn thing. And I'm really excited to be here today. Shout out to Black Enterprise. Shout out to Tammy with that bang on Zeckington today. What's going on, beloved? Hello. I'm so glad you noticed my bang. I want to shout you out for being a moisturized, glowing, ethereal, brightly lit, dark-skinned baddie. We are so happy to have a dark-skinned baddie on the team. And I'm obsessed with this aesthetic. So everybody, follow us at Be Heard Talk. And why don't you drop a compliment in our DMs right now? Tell Stanley how good he's looking. Anyway, y'all, what's up? My name is Tammy David. I'm Be Heard Talk's problematic fave that loves to run her mouth and get people upset. Um, if you want to follow me on IG, you can at Miss David if you nasty, keep up with my shenanigans, or on Twitter at Comrade Tammy if you really don't care about your timeline's well being. So much for that, Tammy. Uh, the 2020 election is crucial. I think most of us have know that and have accepted that our lives literally depend on it, and yet and still the black vote is under attack. Why? Because we have a powerful role to play in this year's elections and forces of darkness are trying to suppress our vote by any means necessary. For instance, we're seeing voter suppression strategies continue to play out like restricting registration, closing polling stations, and limiting early voting. According to the Brennan Center for Justice, from the years 2016 to 2018, states across the country dropped over 17 million people from voting rolls. On top of that, over 200,000 eligible voters were in, inappropriately removed from voting rolls in Georgia. Meanwhile, since Republicans took control of Wisconsin in 2010, they passed some of the most aggressive voting restrictions in the nation, including voter ID laws and reduced time for early voting. It is no accident that many of these measures disproportionately affect Black people. On top of that, we are now targets in what is called information warfare. There are campaigns designed to discourage turnout in our community. In fact, Robert Mueller's investigation of the Russian interference in the 2016 election revealed that African Americans were targeted more than any other group by Russian intelligence. Some of those tactics include creating fake accounts on social media of people pretending to be Black people. And fun fact, Black Enterprise, actually, uh, we did a, a full-blown report that was comprised by Samara Lynn last year. We found, uh, Samara Lynn, we found Black, uh, fake accounts of Black people pretending, a fake account of a person pretending to be Black in order to influence the election. So definitely look that up on Black Enterprise. Um, meanwhile, Earlier this year in the primaries, we saw long lines in places like Georgia, Kentucky, Wisconsin, and New York, making it even more apparent that these forces are trying to steal the election. 
So on today's show, we're discussing the power of the Black vote and what needs to be done to protect it. And to help us in this conversation, we are very pleased to welcome Latasha Brown. She is the co-founder of Black Voters Matter. She is also a fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Plus, she is the co-founder of the Hip Hop Political Education Summit. Now, this is a virtual event that talks about the importance of voting. It's taking place September 22nd, which is National Voter Registration Day, and it will be live streamed on Revolt. Welcome so much to the show, Latasha. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You all, all right, you all set the tone. I was listening. I was like, ooh, that's a good conversation. I was like, I, I got all kinds of thoughts about that. But thank you for having me here. Thank you. Absolutely. We are so happy to have you here. And I actually want to start this conversation by just asking how much of a threat is voter suppression to the Black community come November? Yeah, I think that voter suppression is the number one threat to democracy in general. I think in American democracy, as you said, think about it, in two years, 17 million people, that's a lot of people. And then when you really break down how it was targeted, when you look at exact match, there's something called exact match that however you uh, f sign your voter registration card, that you're supposed, anytime you're signing from the absentee ballot down, if you don't sign it exactly like that, like for sometimes I, sometimes I actually sign my name with my initials. Sometimes I don't. I'm not consistent with it, right? And most people aren't, but they can actually look at your signature and just decide, and they're not signature experts, and just decide it's not you. When you look at 80% of those who were dropped from the rolls from their signature, they were people of color. So we're not making this up. It's like my grandfather said, if it looks like a duck, quack like a duck, it's a duck. We're not making it up that the black vote, it has been targeted and under attack. And so we're still seeing that. I think that we can overcome that. But the truth of the matter is that we are fundamentally dealing with voter suppression. And the way that we've got to deal with voter suppression, I think it's three things. I think it's a short term and there's long term. In the short term, y'all, we got to get it. I don't have any other way to put it that ultimately part of what we get confused is we start having this conversation about voting. Let's have a real conversation about voting. Like the conversation about voting for black folks is usually around, we've got to participate. Voting ain't about participation. Voting is about power. Mm. Let me say it again. Voting is about power. And I'm raising that because I think it's important for us to really shift this conversation. Oftentimes, even when we're doing work on the ground, you know, I've met folks that say, you know, um, I don't know about this candidate. I don't know about this candidate. I don't know. Perhaps there are other people on this, um, on this call that have had this opportunity. I have never voted for the perfect candidate. Now, those of you that have, please tell me when and where and how that happened. For me, voting is really about being strategic. It is a tactical strategy to reduce the harm in my community because at the end of the day, I am protective to those that I love, that those that community that I grew up in, and I'm not leaving anything on the floor. Like some folks say, if I go to the floor and I play a game, I'm taking everything off the table. I'm not leaving any power on the table. And so fundamentally, we gotta be honest about a couple things. One, we've gotta be honest that voting is not the panacea. It is not the end all, it's not the be all. Voting is not gonna solve all the problems. It is not, it is very limited. But we also have to recognize on the flip side of that is that voting is a tool. Mm. It is a key, it is a tool. Just like there are folks that say, well, money will solve all my problems. No, it won't, <laughs> right? But money sure will help literally alleviate some of the things in our lives that we need. It is a tool, it, it, we use it as a tool. The same thing with voting. Voting is not the, the, the answer to everything, but it is a tool. So I do think that when we're looking at this next election cycle, voter suppression is an issue, but there are ways that we can deal with it. Latasha, can I just say you preaching a good word today? You came here like, I just love the energy. Uh, Bianca left a comment in our Zoom. She says, Latasha is looking so on point, hair, makeup, backdrop, everything. So I just, oh, well, to, <laughs> I just wanted to say that along with the energy, you do look great. And I love that voter pin that you have here. Mm. Um, you know, I do want to, I want to just take it back because these voter suppression tactics that we've seen, they're historic, you know, Republicans in particular, and those who are trying to suppress the black vote, they've been doing this for a long time, for decades and for generations. I want to talk about that. And I also want to talk about why is it that they continue to be so successful? Like we've seen this play time and time again, and yet and still, it's still happening in 2020. 
So a couple of things. One, I'm glad you asked that. One, let me say this. While the Republicans have been the most egregious in this, we've also experienced this in the past with Democrats as well. I'm raising this because I need us to really understand that voter suppression is about power. It's about Black people, those who have wanted to eliminate um, and to limit Black people and having political power in this country, what they have done is they've used this as a tool, right? And so on some level, if you got logic, right, if on some level you need to recognize why would it so much effort go into suppressing the black vote if it didn't have some value or some power? So that's why it's always happened. We've got to really be able to shift our paradigm of how we see the vote. I don't know if I could say it has been, I can say it has been um, insidious. It has been ongoing and consistent. It hasn't been as successful um, as they would like it to be. And this is what I mean that there's two things that I like to raise. One, I like to raise that folks always say, well, black folks need to vote. The truth of the matter is, out of all the hell that we go to go through to really be able to get the right to vote, all of what we go through to stand in line for hours, black people actually vote on par with our white counterparts. Let me tell you why that's significant. That based on they've received the, the majority of the financial, the political, economic benefits in this country, the fact that we're voting on par is not a testament of America, it's not a testament to them, it's a testament of us. That fundamentally in our community, we have self-organized and seen this as a tool. Now, does that mean that we need to do more? Absolutely. But we've got to literally be able to recognize that while there have been these strategies to support press the vote. There have been people in organizations like me, organizations that that I actually pattern my work after who have been beating the doors down to make sure that we're actually offsetting that. And that's why it's so important that we're supporting groups that are doing this kind of work. I think the reason why it is, why we're seeing it grow and expand is because America, you know, by 2050, it is projected that America will be a majority, quote, none, a majority non-white country. Right. Democracy sounds good when you got the numbers on your side. Right. But when people of color right now, all of a sudden people get all shaky about democracy. Right. And so my, my point is, we literally have the numbers on our side is a matter of us strategically and tactically using them. And there's a couple of things why I think that to the extent that it has been able um, to be successful in those times that it has one, there's no accountability. Let's look at Georgia. Here it is a governor. The governor of Georgia, here's a man who was a secretary of state that was entrusted to literally be able to have a process to have equal access to the ballot. What did he do? He abused his power. He, we know now that 200,000 folks in the state of Georgia were dropped off the rolls that were, were illegally dropped off the rolls that should have been able to vote in the last election cycle. But what happened to him? He actually got a promotion. He's now the governor because there's no accountability. So I think part of the reason why it has been so pervasive in our community, one, we've got to literally put more stringent um, policies in place and hold folks accountable so that there is some accountability. People who steal do not get held accountable. The second thing I think is really important is that we really have to um, hold this process where we're talking about voting it's so decentralized that in this city right. they do it this way this state they do it this way you know i just found out yesterday that in texas and houston county they're actually going to have 24-hour voting that is amazing to me right how did that come about because there were democrats progressive democrats in houston county that made that happen so when we vote and when we're participating in the process we also have to put people who are progressive and have elements like that that can actually expand it for us. And then I think the third and final thing is he who shows up to vote, is you, that's where you get your power. If you don't show up, it's kind of like I said, a gifted horse, you know, like you got to open your mouth. Like if you won't get fed, you got to open your mouth. The, the bottom line is if we want to build power in our communities, we've got to show up in every single way in multiple strategies to really be able to take that power. So one, that we're holding people accountable, who are working against our interests, and we're putting people in office who are courageous that will make some change that we want. Thank you so much for that, Latasha. I actually want to get the rest of the panel, uh, their voices in here. Uh, before we do, I know we're getting some comments on Black Enterprise. Um, Evan Masternardi says, I completely agree with Latasha as voting as a tool and the way to create the most marginalized benefit to the most marginalized communities. Thank you so much. And um, Marie Canty says, carrying on, on with believing all, all Blacks should vote 
that's not true, but carrying, carrying on with believing all Blacks should vote Democrats, um, and that was an ongoing thread. But, you know, you, you spoke about the power of the vote, um, Latasha, and we've had a number of conversations here at Be Heard, online and offline, about you know, the power, or maybe it's debatable, of protest votes, not voting. Um, I want to actually get your voice in here, Tammy, because, you know, we've had these conversations about how young people, in particular, the, the polls show that when it comes to younger people, especially young, younger uh, Black people, people of color, they're not as enthused to run to the polls. Um, some may even be withholding their vote as a protest vote. Um, so, Tammy, what, what do you say to your counterparts, you know, those who are younger who are saying, like, I understand, you know, the history behind voting, but I don't feel, I don't feel that motivated enough to go to the polls. Like, can you relate to that, Tammy? You know, I, I actually do kind of relate to it. And I know that a lot of liberals get mad at me for this, but I don't really believe in the term protest vote. Because while I do understand I do understand that voting is a very powerful tool. However, fundamentally to me, voting is a right of citizenship. It is something blessed, a gift that you can do with or do not with as you please. If someone gives me a Christmas sweater, I'm allowed to cut it into a crop top or I don't have to ever wear it if I don't want to. But nobody's gonna tell me that I have to wear that sweater on a certain day every year because I was given that sweater. That's not right. If it's a gift, it's an unconditional gift. And that's how I feel about a vote. I think a lot of younger people on the topic of voter suppression, I love talking to youth and younger people about voter suppression because you can really see how these tactics over time infiltrate our community and change the mindset about democracy. It isn't just that they're trying to mess up these elections by throwing votes, which they are. They absolutely are. It's that they also put down our communities by teaching us that not only should we not go to the polls, but our votes don't matter and they will never matter because we aren't going to fund you. It's going to be difficult to vote. Why should you bother if you go? And that's something that I think is definitely on the radar of most youth and that we need to talk about when we talk about voters suppression. I can't get angry at an 18 or a 19 year old that is going to the polls for the first time and maybe someone who was voting in the primaries out in that one county in Texas had to wait seven hours in line to do so. That's crazy and that should not be your introduction to being a citizen of this country, especially when you then have the right to go fight and die in foreign wars. So for me, I kind of feel like it is relatable and it's sad, but I do hold out hope that vote that groups like Black Voters Matter and other organizations that are fighting voter suppression are trying to educate on what we can do to battle voter suppression, even as we feel like we have to go to the polls this November. Because ultimately, without that, the youth are never going to think their votes matter and they're never going to go to the polls. Oh, oh, Stanley, did you want to chime in? Yeah, just, just real quick to kind of like piggyback off of something Latasha said, or at least I guess editorialize it. Voting is a lot like love. Um, voting and love with no action is just a thing. And I think that where a lot of people get mixed up at is that they think like we're told vote, vote, vote because your ancestors did it or because some person got beat up by some other white person. So now you get to do it for free. And those are very important. But voting is an action that should be considered a contact sport because it's step one. And whether you think, whether you like a candidate that wins or not, people who are elected into office feel a deep need to be accountable to their base. What do you think Trump is doing? Trump is literally being accountable to his 35% of people who don't season their food, who have sex with their siblings and hate black people. And he is being consistently accountable to them. Just the same way that in a local race, the candidate who ran on say, I don't know, getting a rent freeze, when they get into office, they fight for a rent freeze. But what's everyone else's interest? And that's why it's important to be, not just vote, but be active with your vote. I'm voting for this reason. And then circle back. You wouldn't hire somebody for a job and disappear for four months, four years, and then come back and be like, all right, let's see how you did. You're engaged, you're doing quality evaluations, you're checking in, you're having conversations. And that's the part of the process that we really have to dig deeper into. 
Absolutely. So, Latasha, they brought up really good points. Um, and I do just want to circle back to see what initiatives you're taking, particularly to engage younger voters. What um, I think Tammy and I touched upon is that I, I, it, from my from from my reading and reports, it seems like that coalition um, is sometimes the hardest to break through to get them to show up to the polls. However, we did see a lot of energy when uh, Bernie was in the primaries. You know, I saw a lot of my, you know, far leftist friends, you know, amped up and ready to vote for Bernie, but I'm having these conversations and they're like, I don't know if I'm going to vote, um, you know, come November since, you know, Bernie's not on the, on the ballot. And if I do vote, it's definitely not going to be for one of the two main candidates. So thank you. I, I'm, I so appreciate uh, many of the things that um, Tammy and, and Stanley, t say how you really feel, brother. Um, <laughs> tell us how you really feel. He always but, does. I know, I know. Um, I do want to, I want to raise something just to illustrate a point. You know, I don't, how many of you all, even how many of you all have worked a job that you didn't like? Did you go, did you go get your check? You damn right. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I need that money. Because I need my damn money. I'm raising this is at the end of the day, voting ain't about you liking somebody, your friends. I'm like, Drake, now I don't need no new friends. I'm talking about power. Ultimately, I have worked for people that I didn't like, but at the end of the day, I'm going to get my check because it is my check and my resources at the point until I can do better to get another job, to do better. But at the end of the day, as long as I'm in this capitalist society, I need money. At the end of the day, in this space, as long as you live in this country right now, as it currently exists, there's going to be a decision made about you. You can't even die and your family um, collect the, 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 the money, the insurance money without having a death certificate. Every single aspect of our lives is actually there is some kind of policy that is decided by voting. And I don't know about other people, but anything that is going to have a have an impact on my life, I'm going to be a part of that. The second part of that is it's almost like you, we're going to withhold the vote. Let me go to a basketball game. If we down at the basketball game and we tied and it's only a couple of seconds, um, a second on the clock, and you know that there is a, uh, you know that there is a referee who is biased. What you gonna believe? We gonna withhold the shot. We not gonna shoot because we gonna prove that this is a bad. We trying to win. We're trying. Anybody that's thinking any other way, you're not thinking like a winner. What you're thinking about? But to me, this is how you're thinking. It's almost kind of like my grandmother used to say to me all the time. My grandfather actually. Do you want to be right or do you want to win? Mm. Like at the end of the day, that's a that's a question. You can have your opinions and all of that. Do you want to be right or do you want to win? And win for me is not contingent. It's not saying this candidate makes me win. Win for me means that whatever I can do when I know that my community is suffering, that I know that my community needs resources, when I know that my community is under attack, anything that I can do to release some of the harm to my community is a win. It ain't about them Republicans. It ain't about them Democrats. It ain't about those candidates. It's literally about what is the most strategic and tactical decision I need to make to reduce some harm in my community so I can build this thing. Most of the time, people who are saying that they're withholding the vote don't do no work, are not fighting for power, are not doing anything. I'm, I'm, I'm really saying it, and I'm not saying it in a way to be disrespectful, I'm saying that this is not a participation game. This is a power game. And we're going to have to get real about what we are de dealing with. Because I don't know if any of you all have been in courtrooms. I have been in a courtroom where I can tell you that when there was a certain DA in that courtroom and another certain DA, that that meant years on the lives of my people. I can tell you when I went in a judge and one judge would give uh, 20, 20 years for a marijuana charge when another judge may give something different. And my point is it does matter. And for us not to say that it matters, to the extent I think that that is problematic. Now, when we're talking about young folks, what I love, like you saying, what I love about young folks is one, they don't have a particular loyalty to the party as my mother and other generations had, which I actually think is really powerful. Because I don't think that any of us should be to, to any beholden to anybody but a black agenda. Let me be real clear about that. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I think that in that context, though, when we're talking about in the context of young people and how they engage, those are the folks I work with. When we're talking about going to the streets and, and people are saying, well, I don't vote because I believe in the process, 
instead of me trying to evangelize them and turn them in and, and convince them that voting is the best thing ever, that's not what I do. What we do is we actually listen. The very first thing we, we say is we affirm, you're not crazy. If you're a black person and you've been in this process and you see that there's some things in this process that you think are not the way they're supposed to be, you're actually right. When you're saying that voting is limited, you're absolutely right. When you're saying that you voted for somebody before and you didn't see the kind of changes, we understand that. Then what I actually do is I get in a conversation with them, but tell me what it is that you care about. Mm -hmm. And then once we talk about what it is that they care about, I make the connection to why that particular election is relevant, right? Because right? at the end of the day, it may not solve everything, but it does make a difference who is in office if you are trying to win, not be right. Now, there's some people just want to be right. They want to have the right opinion. They want to be on the right, whatever. That's fine. I don't, I don't have that need. My ego don't have that need. I'm beyond that. And I, I'm one of them folks that used to have, do that too, right? And perhaps I do that sometimes now. But uh, fundamentally, this is about power. And so the, 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 two, the couple of points I'll just say with young folks that I think is a reorientation of this process, that one, instead of us trying to look for the next um, candidate the next Jesus to come on a horse to save us all, that we be realistic that at the end of the day, our goal is to really vote for someone on alignment around that is a tactical strategy of where we'll reduce the most harm for our community. That's one. Number two, I think young people who are not seeing the kind of candidates that we want to see, that it is your time that this is the first time in history that young people have actually eclipsed the baby boomers. I'm in Generation X. We didn't have the numbers. Young folks now have the numbers. You literally have the numbers to shift the policy and the, in, uh, the entire space in this country. And the third and the final thing that I say is, while I am working with Black Voters Matter, while we're working to get people to participate in the process, I always tell, ask people this question, what is your radical reimagining of America and this nation? So what if you didn't think of yourself just as a citizen? What if you thought of yourself as a founder, mm -hmm. a founder of the new America, a founder of every single system? All of these systems that we know have been biased towards our community. Why can't we envision a way to change them? If systems were created by man, they could be changed, right? And so fundamentally, I think it's a matter of we got to know what time it is. And I think on some level, I don't, I'm not one of those folks that I think because folks are older that they got the right answer or because they're young, they got that right answer. I'm not one of those. I think those who seek the truth and do the work and the learning and the answer and, and the listening, that that's the shaping. So what my organization has been doing is also creating a space and a pipeline for young people, young leaders to lift them up, to be able to give them resources, to really be able to hear right. what our people want and really explore some new ways of being. Thank you so much for that, Latasha. Not only for um, the the work that you're doing, your commitment to empowering, you know, our these these communities, our communities, and especially the next generation who will be leading these communities. I think that the work you're doing is so needed, and I want to thank you for that. We do. I don't know where the time went, but we have you know run out of time. But you bless us with a word. This is getting me ready for the Patty and Gladys night. Um, um, verse is coming up later so I, I'm just so I'm feeling fulfilled today um, I do want to just give some final remarks to the rest of the panel uh, you know Stanley we spoke a lot about not just you know voting you know just to vote but the power in the black vote the power in our votes what are your final remarks as we um, look towards the November election and making sure that our voices are protected at the polls well, the black vote is an important vote. It's the most important vote, in my opinion. And let me just leave you with some basic information. In 2016, for the first time in two elections, white people turned out at a higher clip than black people to vote. And the majority of those white people voted for Donald Trump. Both of Obama's elections, the black voter turnout was higher than white voter turnout because the black vote was motivated. When we turn out and we vote, we win. But also, once you're done voting in a presidential election, it is really important to understand that you need to be building that power in local elections as well. Local elections are just as impactful and important as presidential elections. So make sure you're, you're voting at all levels and you're being active in all levels as much as you can. Thank you for that, Stanley. Um, Tammy, you are our problematic fave. Uh, you've been very vocal in the past about voting and not voting. Um, you know, but just to wrap up this conversation, what would you say needs to be done to make sure that our interests are represented at the polls come this November? You know what, today, 
I don't know if it's because Miss Latasha got me in the spirit, looking all fine, but I'm not going to be problematic. I want to be helpful too. Today, my final words are, if somebody is telling you, if your own government is telling you that you can't do something, you better believe you better do it. I think that if you are ready to vote, and you want to put your voice out there, you need to make sure that you go out there and you do so at all costs. Bring multiple forms of ID, bring bills and residency proof if you need to, wear a mask, bring sanitizer, bring your own pen, social distance, stay in line all day if you have to. But don't let anybody tell you that you can't vote or to try to throw your vote when that is your right as a citizen. The last thing is, I want y'all to know your state laws. Here in New York, according to election law 3-110, you can actually be paid up to two hours on your workday for the election. That means no employer is allowed to tell you that you must work and you cannot go to the polls because of your job. So if you are working, make sure to let your employer know that perhaps you live in a district or a community that is suppressed and you might need extra time at the polls. And if there is an issue, please visit workplacefairness.org, search voting rights, find your council member, and talk about it because they can't stop us. If you live in any other state, that website provides great resources and lets you know if your job will protect your voting right, if you will be paid for it, and how you can get your vote no matter what affecting your check. So thank, thank you, you for teaching us so much, Ms. Brown. And yes, I just want to give you the final word. Um, Latasha, please let us know one more time about your upcoming Hip Hop Political Summit on National Voter Registration Day. So they'll be able to see it on Revolt. We'll stream it on Revolt TV. Um, if you go to the National Hip Hop Summit, you can find us. We also on Black Voters Matter, www.blackvotersmatterfund.org. Um, follow us on Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter, Miss Latasha Brown or Black Voters MTR. Text us. If you want to, seven, nine, we matter to 797979. But stay in contact. We're going to have a ball. We're going to have a conversation about voter suppression. It's going to be on and popping. So please join us on the 22nd for the Hip Hop Summit. Absolutely. And I'll just leave everyone with this. If you have not been convinced to go out and vote, particularly come November, I'll tell you this. One reason you should vote is simply because they don't want you to. And I'll leave that right there. Thank you for everyone who chimed in, who is watching us live, particularly on Facebook, on Black Enterprise. Thank you so much for the comments and the engagement. We appreciate it. Thank you for so those who are watching us via Zoom and Be Heard. We love our loyal Be Heard family and followers who have been supporting us from day one. And continue to watch Be Heard talk on Black Enterprise for the next several weeks. We will be unpacking the 2020 election, the power of the Black vote, and what needs to be done so that we can make an impact in all years moving forward. So we'll see you again next Sunday, guys. Thank you. Peace, guys.